Um, I'd like to uh, continue the program, and we have our second uh, keynote talk of the day. And the speaker is uh, the speaker is Donald Cohn from from UCLA. Uh, so Dr. Cohn is the director of the uh, Human Gene and Cell Therapy Program of the David Geffen School of Medicine. Uh, he has many years ex experience um, of clinical bone marrow transplantation. He's a board certified pediatrician. Uh, his main areas of research are gene therapy for immune deficiencies and for sickle cell disease. Uh, his lab has investigated methods of gene therapy in, in terms of optimal gene delivery uh, and expression in human hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, he has many, many accomplishments, which I won't recite. He's uh, been involved in uh, investigator initiated investigative INDs for clinical trials of autologous um, transplant and gene therapy for genetic diseases. And he's also been the past president of the American Society for Cell and Gene Therapy and uh, past president of the Clinical Immunology Society. And he's also been the chair of the NIH Office of Biotechnology Activities Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee. So it's a real honor to have Dr. Cohn with us here today, and please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you for that nice introduction, and um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this speech, and um, I'd like to thank you all for staying so late in the day. We go. So this is the outline of what I'll, I'll cover. Um, the work that I'm doing is basically autologous stem cell, hematopoietic stem cell transplant uh, as a way of treating genetic diseases. So I'll give a little background on that, and then I'll talk about three of the trials that we're involved with, and the amount that I'll talk about with each will decrease, so they'll, they'll go quicker. This, I'll spend the most time talking about SCID. Okay, good. So this is a list of many of the monogenic disorders that affect um, human blood cell production or function um, that, that affect humans. And all of these have been treated successfully with allogeneic stem cell transplant. So basically by doing an oil change, by eliminating a patient's bone marrow stem cells, giving them new ones that are genetically normal, you can replace these defective blood cells, whether they're red cells, uh, lymphocytes, or, or whatever type of cell they are, and lead to uh, correction of the disease. And that's sort of happened over the last three, four decades. But the main problem with allogeneic stem cell transplant are the immune complications. So we're familiar in the organ transplant setting that a recipient can reject the, the organ, but in hematopoietic stem cell transplant, we also have probably as a bigger problem, the flip side of that, which is donor T cells that come along in the bone marrow or the peripheral blood stem cells can in a sense reject the recipient or cause graft-versus-host disease. And graft-versus-host disease really remains, the, other than the underlying disease, is the major cause of morbidity and mortality after allogeneic stem cell transplant, even using an HLA matched donor which is the minority of transplants and, and at a higher risk when the donor isn't a, a matched sibling, so either an unrelated donor or a haploidentical donor. And so the idea of gene therapy for these diseases that's been around now for about 30 years is that gene therapy using autologous, the patient's own stem cells, that are corrected with the normal gene will have the beneficial effect on blood cell production or function without the immunologic complications of allogeneic stem cell transplant. So that's still a hypothesis that ultimately we'll know in five, 10, 15 years, whether this approach is better than allo transplants. And if we can successfully engineer hematopoietic stem cells, not only can we replace defective gene functions in the monogenic disorders, there's a whole variety of other imaginative approaches that are under study, modifying genes in the stem cells, like knocking out the HIV co-receptor, adding anti-cancer reactivities, or putting in genes, for example, to make the cells resistant to chemotherapy, and a patient getting an auto-transplant for a solid tumor. So it all depends really on the technology of being able to effectively genetically engineer the stem cells. And so that sort of diagram here, are the hematology union requires this slide is shown in all presentations. Um, 
And so basically the task is that we need to get the gene to be normal in the hematopoietic stem cell. And everything to the right of that is a transient amplifi amplifying cell or a terminally differentiated cell. And putting genes into those later cells won't lead to a permanent effect. And so the, the challenge over, over the past couple of decades was how do you do that? And all the work to the present time has been to add a gene to those cells, although I'll, I'll just mention at the end um, some of the ongoing effort to actually fix the defective gene in the stem cells. And um, we use the marker C34, which marks about 1% of the cells in bone marrow, including the stem cells. CD34 cells from marrow are not a homogeneous stem cell population. They're just sort of debulked of the, of the other cells. And so the clinical scheme, and I, Dr. Cherkwe showed a, a, a version of this slide this morning for her work, um, it's of an auto-transplant. So the patient undergoes a harvest either of bone marrow or mobilized peripheral blood. The cells are then taken to the laboratory and genetically modified to add the cell and then prepared for administration to the patient either freshly or frozen. During that time, the patient may receive some chemotherapy to make space so that the cells will engraft and then they're given back. And getting back the, the cells, the actual transplant is the easiest part because you can just give them intravenously and they'll make their way back to the marrow space. So then in the trials, the patients are typically followed for safety. Uh, to document there was engraftment of gene-modified stem cells, and then to look at white blood cell function and, and disease modification. And the tools that are used, as you're, I'm sure you're familiar with, are, are, repl are, are integrating um, retroviridae, either the murine retroviruses that were used sort of for the first decade and a half, or more recently, the lentiviral vectors that we are in the home of since they were basically developed as a usable tool here at the Salk Institute. And either of these viruses have the property of being able to take whatever gene you clone into them, integrate it permanently to the stem cell genome, so that as the stem cell replicates and makes billions of progeny, they will all inherit this genetic material. And so the way the hematopoietic stem cells are typically cultured, they're mixed, uh, they're, they're, they're cultured ex vivo with a, a cocktail of recombinant cytokines that activate the cells, um, commonly C-kit ligand, FLT3 ligand, and thrombopoietin. Uh, plus or minus uh, other things in the presence of the vector. And so these cytokines uh, will activate the stem cells, will upregulate, for example, the LDL receptor for the VSBG protein and it increase transduction. And so a, a little more detail of the processing, although obviously not in great detail. So the bone marrow or mobilized peripheral blood stem cells obtained from the patient are typically processed to deplete red blood cells and then processed for CD34 selection and then cultured for a few days in cytokines with addition of the vector. Um, and then the cells can either be released immediately with just some short-term microbiology testing or will be fully released for everything, including characterization of gene transfer, et cetera. And then the cells are, are given back to the patient. And it, uh, this is um, a process that takes about two or three days to do depending on the specific protocol. So the one other um, uh, concept uh, to introduce is that of conditioning. And I know there was a question this morning about if it's an autologous, why do you need to give conditioning? But in fact, you, you probably do. And so this is, um, this is the uh, LA-USC versus UCLA color scheme here. So if you have, you have a bone marrow full of USC, where I, I used to be, uh, full of bone marrow with uh, USC stem cells, and if you just give a few of the, the blue um, UCLA stem cells, there's really very little space available and very little in grafts. And this has been modeled in mice, and you can get you know, maybe 0.1% of the donor cells engrafted. If you give mega doses, many days you'll get a little bit, but really very little. And so a typical transplant, in fact, is done not for genetic diseases, but leukemia, where there's full myeloablation to kill the leukemia, to make space, and to suppress the immune system, and then the small number of cells that we transplant can largely take over. But what's developed in the field of transplant in the last 15 years or so is less than full conditioning. So full conditioning in a mouse might be 1,000 rads or centigrades of radiation, and reduced intensity conditioning in a mouse might be 200 centigrades, and kind of as you grade the increasing amounts of radiation, you make more space and, and get more engraftment. And so that's been used in the field to, to increase the amount of gene-modified cells that will engraft. So this is sort of a, a space issue and not an immunologic issue, which you don't have. And so the conditioning can be just myeloablative, but it doesn't need to be immune suppressive. So these are the trials that we currently have open at UCLA, and I'll, I'll talk in most details about the first one for adenosine deaminase deficient SCID. We're also part of a multi-center trial for X-linked SCID, 
Uh, we have two new trials, uh, one for sickle cell and one for X chronic granulomatous disease, sponsored by CIRM that I'll, that I'll talk about towards the end. Um, so SCID. Uh, many of you are familiar with this severe, it's a boy in the bubble disease. Severe combined deficiency is the most severe primary human immune deficiency. Patients have absent T and B cell uh, function. N case function is present or not, depending on the types of SCID. And in fact, we know of at least 20 different genes that can give, hu cause human SCID. They can kind of be grouped into those that are involved in T cell or lymphocyte signaling, those who are involved in VDJ recombination, and ADA skid, which I'll talk about, sort of stands off by itself as being a defect of a purine metabolic pathway. And it accounts for about 10 to 15 percent of human skid. And ADA skid is the first form of human skid where the responsible gene was identified and cloned. So it's the first one where gene therapy was, was considered and, and, and approached. And all these forms, independent of genotype, have high early mortality. So for the millennia, all babies born with SCID died of infections in the first few months of life. Um, now we have uh, curative therapies. So if they are lucky enough to have an HLA-MAT sibling, they have a greater than 95% chance of being cured. The, 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 the few that don't make it are those that don't get diagnosed till they have severe infections. But most of the work has been for the majority of patients that don't have a MAT sibling. And there we, we used either T cell depleted parental or haploidentical transplants or matched unrelated donor transplants. And the success rates have been lower, although transplanters, we will always say we're getting better and those are old results. And that's, that's probably true to some extent. So this slide shows all what, what I've been doing for the last 15 years. These are all the, the trials that, that we've done. I'll just briefly take you through this. So um, for, for about um, 10 years, we had an IND to look at two retroviral vectors shown at the top, MND and GC-SAP. These were retroviral vectors that carried human ADA cDNAs. We opened up a trial back in 2000 and treated two patients where we did not give any chemotherapy. So we're using busulfan as our chemo. So these four, first four patients did not get chemotherapy. We were on, on hold then when patients in other trials had complications. When we reopened the trial, the green bars, we gave chemotherapy. And in fact, we, we published these results in blood a couple of years ago. Only the patients that got the chemotherapy got engraftment of cells. So in fact, we, sh we showed in the study uh, th that it is essential to give conditioning. So then when I moved uh, to UCLA in 2009, we opened up a phase two trial using a single, the better of the two retroviral vectors and conditioning and treated another 10 patients. I'll show you some of the results from those. But then because of the growing concerns over the gamma retroviral vectors in 2011, or 2013, I'm sorry, we opened the current trial, um, which uses a, a lentiviral vector. And all of the various support that we sort of swung from vine to vine to keep going on these trials is shown up there. And so the vector that we used in the 2009 to 2012 follow the patient's 2014 study is shown here. So it's a, a, a retroviral vector using a, the myeloproliferative sarcoma virus, LTR, to drive expression of an ADA cDNA. And this is sort of circa 1998 technology at this point. Uh, but the vector works very well. It's, for, for this type of vector, it's made it a pretty good titer, 10 to the 6 transducing units. And it transfers a gene and expresses normal or above levels of ADA. And so in this trial, we treated 10 infants and children um, using this vector into their bone marrow cells after reduced intensity conditioning. So again, busulfan, it would be about the equivalent of 200 centigrades of radiation. And these 10 patients all are alive and well, and there's been good immune reconstitution in 9 of 10. And I'll, I'll show you these results. Um, here, here is um, looking at these patients now out to the, about the present time. And this is showing just the level of ADA enzyme being made in their circulating peripheral blood mononuclear cells. The two red lines across the, the lower part of the, is the normal range for peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So you can see that all the patients except the blue line, which is the one that we failed, are in the normal or above level for making ADA. And it's quite stable over now out to almost uh, five years in one patient. The one exception, the, the patient in blue, was a 15-year-old, and, and so for a pediatrician, that's getting to be you know, at least middle age, if not a senior citizen. We got a very low level of bone marrow in our harvest from him. It didn't take up the gene very well. It, it, he got very little engraftment, so in fact, in six months, we put him back on ADA enzyme therapy, and so he's, he's going along, but has, has really very little engraftment. The other nine who were younger all have ongoing immunity solely as a result of gene therapy. And this is the slide of uh, one of them, a typical best patient, showing the immune reconstitution. So that, just at the top, this was a girl who was three months old. She had an older brother, so she was diagnosed the day she was born as also having ADA skid. 
She got a good cell dose, 6 million per kilo, 34 cells, good copy number, 2.7 copies, and that's a good busulfan level. So kind of everything worked. She was young, she got a good cell dose, good gene transfer, good chemotherapy. So when she came in, she was on enzymes. That's why she had some cells to begin with. We transplanted her, we stopped her enzyme, and then counts came up over time. And so you can see everything we looked at, T cells, B cells, NK cells, AD activity came up. And she's now uh, four and a half years out and, and continues to be stable and, and doing well. And so this, this is a nice result, but our results have been variable. And this is uh, the, uh, the last slide from this trial. This is using quantitative PCR to quantify how many granulocytes the patients had in circulation with the gene in them. And we, we take granulocytes sort of as a surrogate marker for how many stem cells in the marrow have the gene, since the granulocytes are made you know, that week from the stem cells. So you can see there's a lot of variability. There's almost a, a three-log variability in the level of engraftment. I showed you the patient um, third from the, the right. Um, her and the one farthest right have had the best results, have the best marking. Both were three months old, picked up by newborn screening or, or from family history, and, and treated well. And the one I showed you who had no effect is the far left one. So clearly, the level of engraftment of gene corrected cells seems to correlate with the um, clinical outcome and some combination of the, the level of chemotherapy they get, their, their CD34 cell dose, the vector copy number, and age seems to be a negative factor, but we don't know what the exponents are yet. And so that's pretty good news, but as you, you probably know, there have been significant complications in the field of hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy using retroviral vectors. So there have been high rates of genotoxicity from uh, insertional oncogenesis. Trials for XGID where 20 patients had their immune systems restored, five of them went on to get leukemia. In trials for other primary immune deficiencies, wiscott aldrich syndrome and CGD, patients also had leukoproliferative complications. For some unknown reason, an ADA skid between our studies, those in Milan and those in London, out of 44 patients treated, none have developed that complication. And the vectors are very similar, so it seems like there might be something protective about ADA deficiency that, that, that it hasn't occurred. But in fact, in all three studies, when we look at the integration sites, there are integrations that are sort of um, stabilized clones in some genes like EVI1, MDS1, and LMO2. Uh, there haven't been any clonal expansions in any of the patients, and some of them are out even 15 years from Milan, but it's, it's worrisome. And so about the middle of the last decade, about 2005 or so, the field has really shifted away from the gamma retroviral vectors with the long terminal repeats um, and their strong enhancers to a second generation of, re uh, of vectors. And they can either be retro or lentes, the key feature being that they don't have enhancer LTRs. They're so-called self-inactivating or syn vectors. So this new generation of vectors use an internal promoter that can be a strong promoter but doesn't have a lot of enhancer activity. So even though it can drive sufficient production of the transgene product, they don't transactivate adjacent genes where they integrate. And so largely, I think all the trials ongoing now are using that type of SYN vector configuration. And so we opened up a, a trial in 2013 using this lentiviral vector. So again, the X's at the ends are meant to indicate the enhancers are deleted from long terminal repeats. We're using the elongation factor alpha promoter, which like PGK, is a pretty strong promoter without a lot of enhancer activity. And by codon optimizing the ADAC DNA, it's using this element from the woodchuck hepatitis virus that stabilizes transcript. In fact, this vector is making more ADA per copy number than the gamma retroviral vectors we used before. And this was actually made by uh, Adrian Thrasher and Bobby Gaspar at University of College London, and we've done parallel trials with it. And so this vector, uh, lentiviral vectors in general, can be made to much higher titers and concentrated. So this vector has a titer in clinical preps of 10 to the 9th, and we use it at 10 to the 7th. So we're just putting 1% by volume into the cell, so they don't, they don't mind it at all. It, it works very well, and I'll, I'll show you a little transfer data. And so we opened up this, this trial in 2013 uh, for patients with ADA skid lacking donors in, in relatively good shape with primary endpoints of safety, secondary endpoints of gene marking and immune reconstitution. And to the present time, we've enrolled, we actually just did a, did a 15 patient, 15th patient a few weeks ago. So we've treated 15 patients under this study. Those in yellow were patients treated at a year of age or under. California and other states have started doing screening in newborns for SCID. So more and more, we're picking up the patients when they're young and complete, young like two, three weeks of age and completely asymptomatic and free of infections, which is probably a major factor in improving survival. 
And this, in fact, is a survival pooling our data and the University of College of London data. I showed this yesterday at the Cancer Center at UCLA, and so you've probably never seen a Kaplan-Meier curve like this. So we basically, all the patients are surviving to the present time. Um, and 29 out of 30 have remained off other therapy. One patient in the London series got a very small cell dose and ultimately needed to go back on PEG ADA enzyme therapy. And we have no graft versus host disease. None of the patients have developed opportunistic infection. There have been no insertional oncogenesis. Uh, this is data just showing how nicely these vectors transfer genes into human hematopoietic stem cells. So each dot represents the graph given to one of these patients. We're looking at the copy number of the vector in the cells versus the ADA activity. And we, we're aiming to have between about one and seven copies per cell. So we basically hit the mark in every patient we, we've made cells for. And this is then, uh, again, some, some outcome in, in this series of patients looking at ADA activity. The scales actually expand because they're, they're making more ADA. And even our, in this case, the worst performing um, patient 502, the red circles, was a four-year-old. She's even making ADA above the normal level. And these are the, the lymphocyte numbers in this series of patients. So again, uh, once we stop enzyme, the counts come down, but everyone's come up into a, a satisfactory range. Uh, patient 507 is one, uh, the purple line that drops went on steroids for an unrelated reason, and natural lymphocyte counts down. But basically, everyone's having nice uh, immune reconstitution. And in fact, all the patients remain off the enzyme therapy that they, they came in on. And of the eight that are beyond one year, six of them we've been able to stop IVIG. So restoring B cell function is the highest threshold for immune reconstitution. So we've gotten, uh, at least in the first um, eight, six of them off IVIG at this time. And then this is, again, the gene marking in granulocytes. So I showed you the graph on the left before from the retro trial. And so you can see just visually, they were getting much more consistent in graphing of gene-containing cells with the lentiviral vector. And so, in fact, we think that this, this could be a product. And so we're working towards uh, bringing this to, to market. We've applied for orphan drug designation, which was granted a year ago. And then just recently, we got breakthrough therapy designation, which allows us to work more closely with the FDA to, to move this forward, since we are clu clueless academics. So that's, that's where we are with the ADA works. That's obviously the most mature. We've been working on that for a long time. Uh, let me tell you now about the work that we've been doing for sickle cell disease. This is newer. This is basically eight years of work, completely funded and supported by CIRM. Um, I won't go through background on sickle cell disease. I'll just, I'll just cut to what we're doing. And so for this study, we're using a lentiviral vector that has a much more complex payload. So the ADA one was a little promoter, a little cDNA. This is a complex beta globin gene with exons, introns, upstream, downstream, flanking region, and locus control elements. And this is the configuration of the gene that's been shown in transgenics now 20, 30 years ago to be needed to get high-level erythroid-specific expression. And it'd been a, it basically, that, that cassette did not stay intact in gamma retroviral vectors. Michelle Satellane first showed that if you put it into a lentiviral vector, it would be carried intact. And what's novel about ours, this was developed by Tim Towns at University of Alabama, the beta globin coding region has three amino acid substitutions that confer on it the anti-cycling properties of fetal or gamma globin. And so um, primarily the uh, 3 87 deglutamine change is one of the amino acids in gamma globin that's a key uh, factor in it preventing aggregation of HBS molecules. And Tim and his colleagues showed now more than 10 years ago in a mouse model that he made of sickle cell disease, shown on the left with a spontaneous sickling, that if he put this vector into their bone marrow and transplanted it, it basically completely normalized their red cell numbers, their red cell function, and all the other parameters of disease that could be measured in the mouse were normalized. And then he really stopped working on this as he's turned more towards homologous recombination. And so when CIRM first offered their disease team um, grants, um, we said this is the time to jump into this field. And so this was sort of the specific aims for our Disease Team 1 award, which was in year one to just take Tim's vector, which had never been in human cells, and ask, can it go into human hematopoietic stem cells? And, can, and if we do that from sickle patients, can we reverse the sickling of the red cells that are made? And if we pass that first year milestone, to then to go on to try and reach an IND. And uh, we had four years to do it. It took us four years and three months because we had to do a tox study we didn't anticipate. And so what we did in the laboratory was set up a model where we can start on the left with human hematopoietic stem cells and in vitro drive them all the way to become enucleated erythrocytes. And, and they will turn on both their endogenous globin genes as well as the, the globin gene that we've put into the cell with the vector. 
And so we use that to interrogate the vector, and you can see in this isoelectric focusing, um, this is from a sickle patient, so there's their endogenous HBS, and our vector makes this hemoglobin. You, you can see the expression there. And this is the uh, expression of the, the vector RNA um, or, or protein. We're making about 15 to 20 percent of the total beta-like globin per cell per copy of the vector. So it's making about half as much as an endogenous allele. And we know that at least for fetal globin, 5 to 10 percent F is enough to prevent sickling. So we think this is enough to, to prevent sickling. And in fact, we, we show that we developed an in vitro assay to make red cells sickle and quantify them. And this is looking at the percent of non-sickling or corrected cells per vector copy number. And you get about with one copy per cell, we have about 15 percent of the cells that don't sickle. So we have a nice correlation between the number of cells with the gene and the number of red cells that they make that don't sickle. And the, the real challenge with this vector is gene transfer. Because it has this big payload, it has a relatively low titer. And so unlike the ADA where I showed you those copy numbers from 1 to 7, we struggle to get even, you know, 0.5 or 1. But we do get that consistently. So this was a, a large-scale um, pilot study we did prior to the trial where we, we took a large amount of healthy donor bone marrow, transduced it with the vector, and then looked either short-term in vitro um, or then into primary and secondary NSG mice and showed that we had a stable level of gene-corrected cells through that time. It was about 0.35% or 0.35 copies, which would be correspond to about 35% of the cells with the gene. And so based on these data, they support our IND application for the trial that we've, we've now begun. And it's, it's like the one I showed you for the ADA. Uh, we use bone marrow um, from sickle patients, isolate the stem cells, add the vector. And in this case, we're freezing the cells so we can fully characterize them before we ablate the patients. They then come in, get conditioned, and transplanted. Um, so our first trial that we're doing now, it's a phase one trial. We propose to treat up to six patients. And it, although I'm a pediatrician, we decided that for a first in man, it should be adults uh, with severe sickle cell disease who don't have a matched or e matched sibling or matched unrelated donor. And we have a whole list of very specific um, organ function and disease severity criteria the patients need to meet. And this is just how we've set up to organize the study. So it's being done at UCLA by the Adult Transplant Service, and Gary Schiller is the, the PI for the trial. And this is the timeline, then, of the sickle trial. We got the disease team one grant in March of 2010. Uh, we did all the, the pre-IND work, and then we went through the regulatory gauntlet, the RAC, the IRB, the Biosafety, Data Safety Monitoring Board, board to IND. We then applied for another disease team grant, which opened last July. Uh, we then had the clinical grade vector made at Indiana University Vector Production Facility, and then we have now enrolled a first subject up. With, we actually did two bone marrow harvests, so we harvested her marrow in March and made half the product, and then in July I made the second half, and she was transplanted um, 11 or, or, or 12 days ago. And I'll just show you that um, so far, um, so she received the full plan busulfan, um, Again, this would be more like 1,000 rads in a mouse rather than the lower dose that we're using the ADA skin patients, um, 16 doses. And she received her cell products um, by IV infusion. So she got a total of 4 million per kilo cells with an average copy number of 0.25. And she's currently neutropenic from the, the chemotherapy. So watch this space for results. Um, so then I'll just briefly mention uh, the trial that um, we are about to open for CGD. Um, so chronic granulomatous disease is a series of white cell defects where white cells can't make an oxidative burst to kill bacteria. So there's a series of uh, proteins that together make this oxidase complex. And uh, one of the components, uh, GP91, is X-linked and is the, the gene that's defective in XCGD. And so the vector that we're using for this actually has a chimeric myeloid promoter, the Cathepsin G enhancer and the CFES promoter to drive the GP91 codon optimized cDNA, again with a, a RNA stability element. And this vector expresses very nicely. In fact, in, in mouse models, when you put it into stem cells, you see progressive expression with myeloid differentiation. And then this is just a study putting it into cells from a CGD patient. And the normal um, control is, is this red bar showing expression. The green is the expression from the vector. So it's single copy. It's a little less than normal. But even small amounts of, of this protein are enough to normalize oxidase function. And so we set up a, a trial that will be done at three sites. It will be done primarily at UCLA and at also Boston Children's and at the NIH. Um, we'll be enrolling patients. And um, 
the, the trial is, is basically open now, and we're, we're, we're just going through uh, identifying subjects and hope to be having the first patients transplanted within the next month or so. So then just, I'll just briefly mention, in, in closing, gene correction. Um, like many people, we're looking at moving beyond gene addition to actually gene repair uh, by, the, by method I'm sure is familiar to many of you, using uh, endonuclease, either zinc fingers or talons or CRISPRs, to introduce a double-stranded break in the presence of a homologous donor. And we started working on this for sickle cell disease, which seemed like the most logical disease to work on. It was the first molecularly identified human defect, and it's a single base pair. So if we can't fix a single base pair in stem cells, then some of the more um, gymnastic things that are people talking about, like knocking in cassettes, might be more difficult to do. And uh, I won't show any of the data in the interest of time. I'll just summarize that we've looked at m multiple nuclease platforms, ZFNs, Talons, and CRISPRs, and they all lead to on-target cleavage and can support gene modification of the beta globin locus in CD34 cells. We published a paper a few months ago in blood looking at ZFNs that we, rec we received in collaboration with Sangamo, and in bone marrow from sickle cell patients, we were able to show that in vitro, we could correct the sickle mutation in 5 to 15% of the alleles. And so by differentiating the cells and doing HPLC, we could clearly demonstrate that we converted a beta S allele to a beta A allele and made normal hemoglobin. That's the good news. The bad news is, in fact, there were more insertions and deletions at the allele than there were corrections. And so the nucleases are quite active. Homologous recombination is not as effective. And so we're probably breaking more alleles than we are fixing. And the other piece of either bad news or at least challenge is that when we put the cells into an immune deficient mouse model and look three, four months later, the levels of corrections were down about a hundredfold for the correction and about tenfold for the indels. So it appears that the engrafting stem cells are less effectively modified than sort of the short-term progenitors that we, that we grow out in short-term culture. And then looking at specificity with the particular sets of nuclease we looked at, and this isn't universal for all nucleases, but for the, the ones we looked at, we saw some off-target cleavage by the ZFNs and talons at the highly homologous delta globin gene, which is 7 kb away, and in fact was a perfect match for one of the ZFNs and a pretty good match for the other, uh, the other uh, finger. Um, but in fact, the CRISPRs we looked at didn't have detectable off-target cleavage at that site, but we're looking throughout the genome to see where else they might be acting. And so, of course, where we'd like to go in this field, as in many other fields, is to do this through induced pluripotent stem cells, where we'll be able to you know, make patient-specific cells, correct the defect, then drive them to become hematopoietic stem cells and transplant an unlimited source of perfectly gene-corrected cells, but uh, we still have some work to do on, on the production of the hematopoietic stem cells. And so just to summarize in the field, these are some of the trials that are ongoing currently in this area. So I, I talked about a few of these diseases. There's a number of other primary immune deficiencies, lysosomal storage and metabolic and hemoglobinopathy genes, diseases under um, active trial, and a, a number of more on, on their way. So I think you know, one, one gene at a time, we're moving forward and, and um, getting some benefits. And so I'll just stop there and acknowledge all the funding we had. The ADA skid work was supported um, throughout the last decade by the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation that allowed us the time to keep going when we were on hold for two or three years at a time. Uh, the second uh, clinical trial was done with an FDA orphan drug, R01, um, and the current clinical trial is done with a U01 from NIAID. CIRM disease team one and three fund the, the sickle work. The translational study is, is supporting the uh, gene correction. Uh, the CTSI, the CTS1, the um, new uh, accelerated grant is supporting the CGD trial. And our Alpha Stem Cell Clinic is sort of helping us with all of these. Uh, we had our colleagues at the NIH working with us, as well as at other sites. And then uh, the, this is my lab group. Thank you. So thanks very much. Um, question from Inda Verma. So Don, the gene correction is obviously very exciting. How long can you take your CD34 cells and keep them in vitro good enough that they still repopulate efficiently? Because if you could do that, you could actually select much better what you put back into the cell. Right. So to the present time, in vitro culturing of hematopoietic stem cells, you have less every day. And there are multiple papers that claim to have a compound or a way of expanding them. 
but then the next paper knocks down the previous one, and that's only expanding progenitors. Ours is expanding stem cells until the next one comes along. So I think to the present time, no one has usefully clinically expanded hematopoietic stem cells. So in general, we try to have them in culture the shortest time possible, which doesn't allow selection. And so with a gene correction, the, we think some of the major problem with the stem cells is toxicity. And um, so you know, we're, we're losing some of the early stem cells. They're most sensitive to the electroporation with oligonucleotides and, and messenger RNA. All right. Don, maybe you mentioned this, but in the uh, sickle cell case, the patient is not completely depleted, so it's still making its own red cells, too, that have uh, sickle uh, well, beta hemoglobin. So what, what ratio do you need to have a good to bad right. red cells? If you so will? she got what's called fully ablative chemotherapy, but that's not, it's not 100%, you know, maybe 97, 98, but with only 25% of the cells modified, she's gonna have a significant number of cells that aren't gene modified, even from what we put back. So the, the best information, there are people who have had sibling transplants who wind up with mixed engraftment. And even some with only 10 or 20% of donor engraftment, their red cells are 90 to 100% from the donor because they have a normal lifespan. So that sort of sets a threshold, we think, of 10 to 20% gene corrected cells. So we think if we can get engraftment of those cells, we, we might be just there. More would certainly be better. Yeah, a short question. Do you think it's possible to actually use uh, viral vectors for transcriptional factors on cells that have become quiescent to actually prevent them becoming, uh, let's say, more virulent in terms of their senescent uh, signaling mechanisms? Well, I, so stably inserting transcription factors into a patient's cells makes me nervous. Um, you know, just because you, you may, what you probably want is a short burst of expression and not sustained decades expression like we're trying to get for our deficient genes. So there are certainly other ways to, to do that transiently. Uh, there are non-integrating lentiviral vectors. There are, you know, RNA approaches. And so, you know, I, I would think rather than using a, an integrating vector, you might want to look at some type of gene transfer method that isn't going to get ideally permanently uh, permanent expression. What would you want to perform that as the person ages because that's why Yes, although I, I think you know with a transcription with a transcription factor into a stem cell, I think there's a high burden of proof of the, of that's a safe thing to do. Because I, I just worry, I, it, it, so in, in the field of gene therapy, these complications I talked about in hematopoietic stem cells really contrast to results with T cells. So there's thousands of people that have gotten gene-modified T cells with no clonal expansion. So I think stem cells are uniquely susceptible to insertional events. And so if you have a little insertion like a genesis from a vector and a transcription factor that promotes growth, I think that could be a setup for, for an adverse event. Don, yes. do you think there is any risk of uh, immunologic rejection of gene transfected cells? Yes, I, so the, that's certainly possible. Obviously, in the SCID setting, it's kind of a best case scenario because they don't have an immune system to reject it. Um, and so we, we've talked about that for all the gene products we're putting in. So for the sickle gene therapy, we're putting in a modified beta globin that has three amino acid substitutions, but two of them appear in other forms of, of hemoglobin in a context of a peptide that's pretty similar, so we don't think that's likely. One of them is different. There aren't any that we can find clinically reports of, case, uh, of immune responses to other globins. You know, when patients with sickle get um, non-sickle marrow or non-sickle red cells, they have an amino acid change. So it doesn't seem like hemoglobin is immunogenic in that setting. Uh, for CGD, that's possible. For patients who've, never, who've been null for the gene, the normal gene product may be foreign, and so it's possible that peptides will be presented, and so that's, that's part of the immunologic monitoring that needs to go on in these studies. Yes. Behind you. Um, the gene therapy used actually used uh, lentivirus uh, uh, as vector to deliver a gene. So uh, do you think what is any long-term uh, risk of uh, those vector uh, uh, were 
uh, stay, you, you know, in the patient, what, what is it gonna cost? Uh, second question is uh, uh, you, the uh, gene correction rate in vivo actually is much lower than in vitro. Uh, do you know why it's much lower? Um, so I, I, I guess the, the, so the first question was, um, do we worry about like mutations occurring in the gene? Right. Yes, and, and so the, it, it, does the vector have risk? Yes, there is the risk of insertional oncogenesis. Um, we think with the LTR enhancer deleted ones, that risk is much lower. It's probably not zero. There's still a possibility of and a, a rare but possibly that you've disrupted tumor suppressor genes by the insertion event. And so any integrating vector, I think, has a, a small risk. Um, so far in the 100 or so patients who've gotten lentiviral vectors, there haven't been any complications. That's a relatively small number. Um, and the second part was? Oh. Ag no, ag in, in vivo than in vitro? Yeah. Yes, I, I think um, in, in general, the hematopoietic stem cells, the earliest cells, are the hardest to gene modify. And what we measure in our in vitro assays are um, more like progenitors, the teenagers. They're easy to modify, but the babies are harder. And so if you, depending on how you read it out, in a short-term assay, you're reading out the progenitors that are easy to modify. It's only in a transplant model where you look months later or do a secondary transplant, you're really looking at something that was a stem cell at the beginning. That was wonderful. Thank you Thank very, you. very much. I think we're in a...